All right, guys, we're going to get started here. I want to start off by telling you a little bit of story about this critter. This is scientific name, Xenopus lavis, which uh, the common name for this frog is the African clawed frog. You could probably guess how it got that name. It's got some pretty neat looking claws there, even though they're pretty flexible and they're not dangerous. Um, but I want to talk to you about something really interesting about these frogs. They, uh, you know, a female African clawed frog won't lay eggs unless a male is around. They don't want to waste energy laying eggs if there's not a male around to fertilize the eggs. So they'll wait, and and uh, before they start laying all of these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of eggs, they'll wait for a chemical signal in the water. All right, this chemical signal is called human chorionic uh, gonadotropic hormone, or just known as HCG. And when the HCG, HCG is present in the water, the female will lay the eggs, and the male will come around, fertilize the eggs, and they'll develop into little xenopus tadpoles. Um, there's, but there's something really interesting to talk about here with the HCG. And there's actually a few interesting things. One, well, you can buy it right online. You can get it off Amazon for about 15 bucks. I think that's kind of weird. And the other is, and this is why I think it's weird, the other thing about this is it's the exact same hormone that human females produce in their urine when they're pregnant. All right, and that's that's why with pregnancy tests, what they do is they detect HCG. And, you know, if there's a lot of it in the urine, it'll come up positive, meaning that, that she's pregnant. So these African clawed frogs then, for a very long time, were used actually as pregnancy tests. You could take a frog, uh, you would somehow, I'm not sure the exact process, but they would uh, subject it to the urine from a female human. But they would make sure that frog was nowhere around uh, any male frogs. And within 24 hours, if that female frog had released a bunch of her eggs, that means HCG was, was present. And it was amazingly accurate, about 80% accurate, 80, 85% accurate. And not compared to uh, the ones we have today, which are 99% accurate or something like that. But it's this kind of weird interaction between hormones in the frog world and in the human world. Uh, so next thing I want to talk about here that I want to kind of link this all to is the importance of biology. And that's just one kind of neat story. But we have this huge story going on right now. And it's this global spread of a fungus called chytrid that is getting into the water supply and just wiping out frog populations around the world. All these red spots here are where uh, the chytrid has, has basically started locally going through mass extinctions of frog species. And it's, it's kind of a scary issue. All of a sudden, the frog populations are dropping. You know, you, you can think of that locally here, too. We have bat populations dropping. There's, there's a lot of things going on. In fact, I want to read you a little quote from from a book called The Bridge at the Edge of the World by, by James Gustav Speth. And he said, half of the world's tropic and temperate forests are now gone. The rate of deforestation in the tropics continues at about an acre a second. About half of the wetlands and one third of the mangroves are gone. An estimated 90% of large predator fish are gone. 20% of the corals are gone. And another 20% are severely threatened. Species are disappearing at rates about a thousand times faster than normal. That's happening right now. Uh, here's an article that was taken a few years ago, and you can find other articles just like this that are printed pretty regularly that potentially, a lot of biologists agree, we are in a sixth mass extinction right now as, as we speak. All right, the world has seen five mass extinctions. The last one was the one that wiped out the dinosaurs that we, we seem to know the most about. But right now, we're looking at a mass extinction that is decimating certain species around the world. So this is a very important reason as to why we should start studying biology, why we need to know biology. Uh, without these species, we could have food chains collapsing, and we need to really understand what's going out, on out there. And that's, that's sort of what we're going to do this year. We're going to learn the basics of biology in hopes that you know they'll, they'll bring, bring a better future. But the first thing we need to do when we're studying biology, or with any science really, is we need to know how to study science. And a lot of, of studying science is looking for patterns. All right, here's a beautiful pattern in, in this shell. 
uh, actually is a pattern we can explain mathematically through a sequence of numbers known as the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, I'll write a few out here, see if you can figure out the pattern. Fibonacci sequence goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and on and on and on. Uh, and if you can catch this, here's what's happening. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8. And we can make this little pattern with these numbers of boxes. And what we'll find when we do that is it creates this swirl, this beautiful swirl that we see in nature quite often. That's a Fibonacci sequence. All right, we see it here. This is um, a type of, it's a hybrid of broccoli. You can see that swirling pattern. Wouldn't you love to eat something like that? It's pretty neat. Seems very exotic, but, you know, it's also uh, patterns that we see every day in, in the world around us here. Here's just a, a pine cone, and you can see that same swirling sequence that follows the Fibonacci, right? So... You know, I'm not really getting into Fibonacci numbers here for, for any mathematical purpose, but just to show you and explain to you that science is about problem solving. All right, problem solving oftentimes is about looking for patterns. And so we need to understand the best process to look for patterns, the best process for problem solving, and that, of course, is going to bring us into a scientific method. So anytime you have an experiment, anytime you want to try to solve a problem, you need to find patterns. And to do that, you need to first go through this process. You need to ask a question. What are you trying to figure out? You research it as much as possible. From there, you're going to construct a, an educated guess. Then you're going to set up an experiment to test that educated guess, collect the data, analyze the data, figure out what's going on, draw some conclusions from the data, and then share your results with the world so that other people can build on what you've learned. All right? So I want to talk about the hypothesis really quickly, and I've always liked this quote, truth in science can be defined as the working hypothesis best suited to open the way to the next one. Uh, so we think of it as an educated guess. It actually does go deeper than that. But uh, for the time being, we're going to stick with that educated guess idea, and we're going to stick with the basics of the, the if-then statement. You remember this, right? And to give you an example of how we write a hypothesis, we have an experiment. I'll, I'll come up with something very simple here. My dog. My dog, Maggie, she, uh, I want to find out if she likes moist food or dry food better. So I could say, all right, my guess, my educated guess is if I give Maggie moist food versus dry food, Sorry, I'm losing my letters here. Then she will like, let's make a guess, the dry food. You notice I made a guess here. I have an if-then statement. So it's a good way to do a hypothesis. What you don't want to do, I've seen this happen a lot, a lot, a lot in school. Don't say something like, if I give Maggie moist versus dry food, then she will like one of them. That's not a guess, right? So you need to make sure to essentially choose a side, and it helps keep you honest through your experiment. And you can be wrong. It's okay to be wrong with a hypothesis, but it helps guide your experiment. Okay, so when we start to test that hypothesis, setting up an experiment, you might recognize some of these words. We need to begin thinking about the variables of an experiment. The first one we start with is the independent variable. And this is what I like to remember as the thing that I choose to change. Think of that I in independent right there. As the thing that, as the thing that I choose to change, all right. So I'm going to do an experiment here. I'm going to grow some zucchini plants, uh, and they, uh, I'm going to use Miracle Grow to to see how well they grow. And I'm going to choose five milliliters of Miracle Grow, ten and fifteen. So I chose the amount of Miracle Grow. That's my independent variable. The dependent variable is what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, I put the sort of the simple definitions in purple here. What I'm trying to figure out, and I want to know. How much does the plant grow? All right, for the for the one with my dog Maggie, uh, I chose dry versus moist food. What do I want to figure out? What's my dependent variable? Which one she prefers? Simple as that. The control group in an experiment is the one that receives no experimental treatment. All right, think of your independent variable, and don't give one of them at least that independent variable. In this case, my independent variable is the miracle grow. 
the amounts of miracle Grow. So I'm going to have one that gets no miracle Grow at all, just water. That way I can tell if the rest of them are growing because of the miracle Grow, or if they would have grown the same height with or without it. That's what the water one is for. That's my control group. All right? So in class, we're going to do a little practice with these, with the independent variable, dependent variable, and control group. And we'll come back to our second lecture after this.